Okay, so hi everyone. Good day to all our participants who are joining here uh, from Australia, the Philippines, and probably other parts of the globe. My name is uh, Redden Resho, and I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow here at the Informal Urbanism Research Hub at the University of Melbourne. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where this event is being hosted, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today's seminar is part of the Inverse Emerging Scholars webinar series, and I'm pleased to be welcoming a friend and a fellow urban scholar as our speaker, Dr. Chester Arcelia. Chester is currently an Associate Professor of Economics, Development Studies, and Sociology at the University of the Philippines, Manila. His work centers on helping the poor in their struggle for uh, the right to the city. He has also made a significant contribution to understanding what he calls home unmaking as an element of neoliberal urbanization in the global south. Chester's presentation today is titled Unhoming the Urban Poor, Socialized Housing, Displacements, and Subaltern Resistances in the Philippines. Chester will speak for 30 minutes and then we will open the floor to questions and discussion. So guys, please use the Zoom chat function later to share your questions and we'll get to them after Chester's presentation. Okay, so Chester, over to you. Right, uh, let me just share my, my screen. Okay, um, I'm hoping you can see my screen, right? Um, so first, let me thank uh, Infor and uh, particularly Drs. Reden, Crystal, and Kim for having me uh, and letting me share part of my research. Right? So as uh, Reden mentioned, I'm, I'm going to be talking about socialized housing practices and the political economy of socialized housing in the Philippines and how subalterns who are facing uh, forced evictions and demolitions are resisted. Right? So uh, basically, this is the presentation outline. So I'm going to be looking at the practices of socialized housing in the Philippines and linking it to issues of affordability and financial evasion at the macro level. And then uh, looking at how uh, in the last 10 years or so, capital influx has actually entered uh, the socialized housing uh, system, both directly and indirectly, and which produced a uh, a dual housing crisis, right? On the one end, you have huge housing needs and forced evictions, massive forced evictions. But on the other end, you produce uh, housings where the poor don't want to live in, right? So, uh, and then I briefly look at the implications for the democratic participation of the poor and how they resist in terms of uh, home remaking in the city, um, people's plans and uh, barricades to occupy movements, the more radical collective action. Now, just a methodological note, uh, this uh, presentation is based on uh, ongoing and completed multiple researches that have been based on ethnography, storytelling, uh, macroeconomic analysis. I'm currently still uh, uh, doing the research on financialization and uh, facing the subaltern militant history among uh, the urban citizens. So uh, let me begin by briefly going back to why am I using home as a frame, right? So this is inspired by uh, feminist homemaking literature that comes from uh, feminist geographers, subaltern urbanism, and uh, assemblage thinking, right? So this is, uh, uh, in particular, for instance, we can talk about uh, the works of Fortress and Smith on domicile and how women are, <coughs> who are traditionally tasked to ensure family welfare are bearing a greater burden of the task of homemaking, right? And then uh, I also take inspiration from Bayat and the succeeding uh, literature that looks at uh, the everyday resistances of the poor, right? And then uh, link that with assemblage thinking where uh, the incremental and ingen ingenious assembly of human and non-human components go into the process of homemaking, right? So I treat homemaking among the poor as a precarious and incremental process and the home as a container and space of flows linking both histories, futures, emotions, bodies, families, and economy. And I'm hoping that I can make this clearer as I proceed with the presentation a little later. 
so, uh, so what is a home? And I take this uh, response from uh, Bashon, who was a, a victim of a demolition in 2014, but she was able to remake her home in the same slum three years later at the expense of breaking up her family and her uh, youngest teenage daughter having an early pregnancy because she had to live with her boyfriend because they couldn't fit in uh, a cart. Right? So uh, this is where our roots are. Here we stood, here we fell. We are living here because everything is near. There is a hospital, there are markets. It is easy to earn a living. Here at least we can send our children to school. Even if we are poor, we can find ways because everything is cheap. If we move to our far place, referring to the resettlement, what do we do? We are vendors and this is where we belong. Right. So um, let me mark the, uh, the effects of home and making, and this is moving beyond uh, the consideration of shelter as, a, as a, a space or a physical infrastructure, right? So there's a, uh, this is a quote I've taken from Lorna. Uh, she was also able to remake her home after being demolished. But this is really, uh, I, I keep on remembering this. And she said, when I stare at the space where my home used to be, I'm happy, right? So there's a loss of capital and income, and this is obvious, and a loss of social support and networks among the poor, which allows them to survive. And then there's a, a homemaking allows us to mark the children's trauma and the disruption in school. And Celine, who is a very young, courageous activist and a demolition survivor, uh, told me a story that when she asked her daughter, who could barely talk at that time, her daughter said that uh, in response to a question of, where is your home? And, and the daughter said, Mollish, right? It was a two syllable word um, where she remembered how her home was torn, torn down, right? And this is the home is a fulcrum where distant family relations were maintained. Either earnings in the slum helped provide for the needs of spatially distant families. So uh, earnings in city flow to rural poverty families, right? It's also a space where uh, families from afar go in to access uh, social services like education, uh, maybe temporary employment and medical services, right? So, so by thinking about the home and its relation to other spaces and other families, we can uh, better link its uh, uh, relationships spatially and both, uh, and family. So, uh, let me now go to looking at socialized housing practices in the Philippines and uh, trying to understand what's creating a situation that uh, forced eviction becomes a permanent uh, a feature of the uh, Philippine economy. Right? So socialized housing is a, is, a, is a program that has been instituted in the Philippines since the 1990s. Right? So it's regularly adjusted price ceiling and, and it targets the poorest 30% Filipino. So uh, uh, housing is treated as a commodity, right? And it uses a completed housing approach. It means that uh, basically a housing lot is completed and it's sold to the poor uh, using monthly compounded interest rate. And I highlight that the interest rates is compounded monthly as if you're a middle-class family buying a subdivision, right? And the re relocatees are evicted after three months of consecutive non-payment, right? So the price of the of the completed housing includes the price of the public spaces, including the roads, open spaces, drains, electricity posts, and so on. A lot of the middle class in the Philippines don't pay for that. Right? They simply pay for, for the lot and the house. Right? So, um, now to decrease costs, a lot of the contractors uh, would of course locate in very urban spaces, right? So where land values are, are, very, are very low. And precisely because they're very low, these spaces have very little access to livelihood and social services. Uh, transportation cost is very high and so on and so forth. Right. So uh, if you want to take a look at diagram, I develop a diagram that links both uh, the National Housing Authority, which is the official uh, state housing agency. And basically it links, it acts as an intermediary between the supply and the demand for, for socialized housing. So on the one end, you have the demand of informal settlers. Um, so based on their livelihood and capacity to pay, right? Um, incidentally, the National Housing Authority admits that its primary task is involuntary eviction, right? Involuntary evictions and demolitions. And therefore, it violently creates the demand 
for socialized housing. Right? So on the other side is supply of private contractors. So they, uh, they purchase a lot, uh, land, they do the site development, and uh, they do the unit construction following the standards set by the National Housing Agency. And, uh, and they take care of the financing at, at the construction stage. And then they sell all of that subdivision and the constructed uh, homes uh, to the National Housing Authority, which in turn the National Housing Authority sells to the, to the clients, to the beneficiaries using uh, slightly subsidized uh, state credit. So uh, the credit is amortized for 25 to 30 years and it has a, um, I think the, the interest rates are lower now, but it used to be 6% to 4.5%. So uh, recently it has also entered uh, construction for the police and the uh, typhoon victims. So um, what you see there in, in uh, in the slide is a picture of a typical uh, resettlement site, right? These are loftable resettlement sites. Um, the, there's a provision for the second floor, but if you are a little bit taller, let's say you're five seven or five eight in height, you have to stand not erect because you hit the ceiling if you if you do that, right? So, uh, so on the side are uh, the price ceilings since year 2000 because that is, was when when the completed housing approach was adopted. So from 180,000 pesos to something like 480,000, depending on the size, to 580,000, right? So these are the price ceilings, right? So uh, what I did in one of my uh, research is, is compare that with the uh, with affordability levels based on the uh, target clients, which is the poorest 30%. So what you see there is a tabulation of the mean incomes of the poorest 30% Filipinos from year 2000 to 2015. So the lowest three lines are the mean income. So, so the bottom line, the poorest 10% and so on, right? And then the next three dotted lines are the affordability levels based on the uh, accepted indicator globally of three times the gross income. Right, so that's the affordability level since year 2000, right? And the top line, which doesn't intersect anything, is the uh, price, socialized uh, price ceiling, right? So uh, obviously, based on the price ceiling, affordability is a challenge for the socialized uh, housing program in the Philippines, right? Now, uh, of course, the 30%, uh, uh, the three times the gross income uh, does not apply very well to conditions in the global south, right? Because if you look at the data, even the richest 10% in the Philippines only spend around 10 to 12% of their incomes on housing, right? So in the next slide, what I do is I look at the actual incomes of the poor for 2015, which is the latest data when I was doing this. Uh, so on the first column is the average family income. And based on that income, they spend uh, a certain amount on uh, on rent or uh, on housing, which is located on the second column. Everything is in Philippine pesos. Uh, the conversion to U.S. dollars is one to around fifty, if I'm uh, if I remember correctly, right? So um, on the last column, I computed using the very same computation uh, methodology of the National Housing Authority how much they can actually afford in terms of a thirty-year loan using an interest rate existing in 2015 of 4.5%, right? And the cheapest state housing at that time is 240,000. And this is off city. Um, and if you look at the last column, it's obviously unaffordable to the poorest 40% Philippines, right? So the target of the program is the poorest 30%, but even the next decile cannot afford it, right? And this is actually based on pre-relocation income which means that these are current incomes of where they are now. And when you relocate people, those incomes drast drastically go down, right? So uh, obviously, it, uh, if you had that data, the, the result is going to be much worse. Uh, okay, um, so, so these practices have been initiated since the year 2000, and they're mainly focused on supply side reform, right? And they're, meant to invite participation from the private sector. And, uh, and the belief is that if you increase the supply of uh, socialized housing, uh, affordability would actually resolve itself, but it has not. Right? So uh, 
but there's an additional problem in the last, uh, all right, uh, let me take a look at what's happening currently. So we have a very huge housing need. Uh, if you're looking at the white portion of the slide, uh, households in an unacceptable housing, which includes households in um, informal settlements and the homeless is around uh, 900,000 families, right? In terms of slums, which is a different classification uh, used by the UN Habitat, around 43% are slum dwellers. Uh, if you're looking at the Philippine capital, Metro Manila, 37% are slum dwellers in 2010, and they're projected to increase 8% annually according to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, right? In terms of informal settlements alone, in terms of formal tenure, right, around 20 to 27% of Metro Manila in 2011 are, are informal settlers. Uh, one of the reasons is that there's very low budgetary app, uh, allocation for socialized housing. Right, so uh, it's actually the lowest in the last 10, 15 years in the whole of Southeast Asia. Now, what if there's sudden capital influx to the socialized housing sector? Right, so uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about. So given the practices of commodified shelter and supply side interventions, what happens when there's sudden capital influx? So in the last 10 years, there has been two major sources of capital influx for socialized housing. The first one flows through public-private partnerships. This is where um, real estate, very large real estate, um, advance the liquidity, the capital liquidity, to build resettlement so that they can evict in-city slums, right? And they partner with the state and the state guarantees the slum eviction, so basically lends it coercive and legitim legitimacy powers to the, to, the, uh, to the corporation. And the corporation's investment in the socialized housing becomes part of its investments that are recoverable at the end of the project, right? So this is uh, one of the funding you know, capital influx. The second one is, uh, um, what you see there is a mapping of uh, a lot of development projects in the Philippines that use that uh, mod modality of public-private partnership. And, they can range from uh, housing, airports, uh, roads, uh, um, seaports, and so on and so forth, right? So if you apply the same logic and if slums are located within those areas, it's going to increase uh, uh, forced eviction using this modality, right? The second is that uh, the National Housing Authority was granted uh, from 2011 to 2016 a massive increase in funding partly because of a Supreme Court ruling that directed Metro Manila uh, local governments to clear danger areas, particularly uh, river waterways, right? So uh, from, for instance, from 20, 2007 to 2011, which is five years, the NHA only had 5.6 billion. And suddenly uh, there was a, a multiplication of the funding that they got uh, to 112 billion uh, from 2011 to 2016, right? So uh, with that capital influx, um, before we go there, uh, what's the relationship of the general uh, economic condition of the Philippines to that state of affairs and the availability of capital to go into socialized housing, both directly through the state and indirectly to real estate, public-private partnership? One, there's a, an increasing economic growth in the Philippines for the last uh, 10 years or so, pre-COVID, of course, and there was ex state, excess state liquidity and underspending by government. So government was looking for a way to invest and propel the economy, and socialized housing was one of them. Of course, uh, pushed by interest in the real estate sector. The other is that, uh, driven by over overseas remittances and foreign investments, the financialization of the economy and particularly the real estate sector provided large corporations. Uh, it's an economy of scale argument uh, on the one end. So it provided real estate uh, corporations, the very large ones, uh, the required liquidity and profit margins to actually fund large scale resettlements of uh, in city slums, right? In order to build really large development projects or what are often our central business districts. Right, so uh, we can take a look at the increasing share of the financial insurance and real estate sectors, but this graph is uh, much more interesting. So what you see on the left is, uh, is the house prices in the Philippines. So except for the 
for the periods where there was a, a global financial crisis and the COVID, the housing prices in the Philippines were really going up. On the right are prices in particular of condominiums and townhouses, right? So these are um, modalities of housing that are located in cities, right? So, uh, so generally the housing prices in the Philippines have gone up, but what is shooting up really are the prices of uh, high rise condominiums and townhouses, right? Middle class to upper middle class housing. Okay. Right, so uh, of course the problem with the supply side intervention, even with the capital influx, is that it basically neglects the demand side problem. Right, and I'm going to be reading a 2018 World Bank report because, you know, World Bank is, <laughs> is, uh, is better in terms of uh, highlighting something that's uh, not so good. So between 2001 and 2016, the country's real GDP more than, uh, more than doubled, growing by an average of 5.4%, and labor productivity also increased significantly within this period. By contrast, however, and this is very important, real wages remained flat in the same period with seven out of 15 years neg registering negative growth rate. Except for public workers, this pattern holds across employees, levels of education, the nature of work, and the class of work. Right? So the wages in the Philippines are actually not going up, the real wages, and in some years, they're actually going down. Right? So informal employment uh, has also increased and it now represents around three-fourths of the total employment in the country. And it of course across varied uh, classes based on education and so on and so forth. Right? So it ignores the lack of livelihood, the decreasing real wages, and the increasing informality in the Philippine economy. Right? So, so with the lack of affordability of the socialized housing program and the supply side reforms and the sudden influx of uh, state and real capital. What's happening then to the socialized housing program in the Philippines, right? So uh, we have huge and unmet housing needs on the one end, uh, but there's also increasing evictions and from, uh, based on the data provided by the Philippine uh, Commission on the Urban Poor, from 2008 to 2016, some 620,000 families have been evicted and relocated, right? So uh, there's a huge unmet housing needs, massive evictions, but there's also empty housing, right? These are uh, the offshoot of the massive capital influx into the socialized housing program. But because uh, contractors are, relocate, uh, are, are locating in spaces that are low value, where livelihood is difficult to source, right? Uh, the potential beneficiaries are finding different ways to resist being relocated to, to these spaces. So there's very low occupancy rates, retention rates, and repayment rates in these areas. As of 2017, for instance, around 46% of the units that were built in the last five years are empty, right? And amortization inefficiencies is up to 92%, meaning that for every 100 million, government can recuperate uh, around 8%, right? So it's a massive waste of state funds, um, and there's very low retention rates people who can't survive in the relocations, the beneficiaries, they move back to the slums or move to the provinces. Um, I'm going to discuss that a little bit. Of course, this is uh, reflective of the global phenomenon of empty housing, right? So it's not unique to the Philippines, right? Okay, so if we summarize uh, that, uh, we have at the macro level, uh, the increasing reliance of the Philippine economy given its deindustrialization for the last 20 years on the real estate sector, right? Although it's not yet that dominant compared to European countries, there's increasing influx of capital into the real estate industry, and particularly the financialization of real estate companies, right? So there's ex excess liquidity from the state, at least pre-COVID situation, and then the remittances are driving gentrification that enables economies of scale and profitability to fund of city resettlement. Of course, that ignores the labor precarity and the zero wage growth. And then you combine that with the financialization of the housing practices, the supply side reforms, and the entry of state uh, subsidized state credit because of ex uh, excess state liquidity. Um, I'm going to discuss later how that practice socializes, socializes risk and uh, cost, but privatizes profit. Uh, all of that combined uh, produces a 
a state of affairs where uh, uh, socialized housing is unaffordable and you produce a dual housing crisis. So uh, let me read this. Uh, so how does that, that entire thing, uh, socialized risk, right, and privatized profit? So through the so subsidized socialized housing pro mortgage program, the relocated poor families and the Filipino taxpayers bear the cost of low occupation, asset deterioration, and substandard construction. When units remain vacant, taxes are channeled into unused, unsuitable, and wasted housing infrastructure. When occupied, as the poor are compelled to purchase via in involuntary relocation, the beneficiaries pay for any substandard construction and depreciation due to low occupation, and the taxpayers shoulder direct subsidies of uncollected arrears and the cost of low amortization uh, payment. Contractors, on the other hand, are guaranteed their payments and profits, and uh, often have additional rents from utility retailing. The NHA, on the other hand, projects these as shelter accomplishments because its mandate is reduced to shelter production. So both the NHA and the real estates gain in the process, which sustains the process, but it's the, it's the Filipino taxpayers in general and the beneficiaries who shoulder the cost and the risk of the entire system. Right, so, uh, What's happening, therefore, to, uh, uh, to, the, to the housing practice in terms of uh, the attempts to democratize it, right? So there are obvious uh, implications. The location and design are determined by cost considerations rather than needs. So it's the contractors and the NHA that determine where the sites are going to be located. The design is a 22 square meter box, right? Regardless of family size, of, of gender distribution within the family, and so on. Um, so amortization, I've computed the amortization and actually the principal actually goes up uh, even though the beneficiaries are paying religiously for 10 or 11 years. So the entire system actually uh, increases the debts of the families that are buying the, the resettlements up to 10 or 11 years, right? So uh, the consultation process is uh, regardless of its uh, output, if you're looking at the process below, this is a process of the LGU and the National Housing Authority. You end up in the resettlement, regardless of the, uh, of the output of the process itself. So legally, uh, three attendance sheets are taken as a proof of adequate consultation. There's little discussion on livelihood and social needs. And I often hear this uh, among those who are pushing for resettlement uh, uh, from state uh, housing agencies or local governments. Uh, do not rely on government from li for livelihood. Right? Wag pong umasa sa sa gobyerno sa kabuhayan. Right. So, so it, there's very little space for democratic participation within this entire system. So, um, how do the the poor respond to to a crisis like this in a system that uh, basically does not allow democratic participation and impoverishes the poor? Um, the first one is a uh, people go back to the slum, right? And I'm taking inspiration here from Bayat's quiet encroachment, but I'm reframing it as home remaking because that allows a better understanding of what's, what's happening. So I basically lay down the process of, of going back to the slum. One is you secure enough funds, right? You either uh, use your savings, you liquefy remaining assets, you borrow money from relatives in the provinces, or you pawn or sell your relocation unit. That's illegal, but there's a very huge market that exists in the resettlement of pawning or reselling of resettlement units. So the very instrument that the state uses to displace the poor is actually used by the poor to go back to the slum, right? So you find a space in the slum uh, for obvious reasons, familiarity and social networks, you go back to where your previous house was located. So you find a space there. Right? It doesn't matter whether it's on the street, it's on a street island, somewhere, a very small crack on the road. And then you find a way to access livelihood. Right? So sometimes you have to pay uh, gatekeepers, right? the security guards, uh, low-level uh, low barangay officials in order to build your shack. Right? And then uh, you survive uh, continuous forced eviction because you go back to the slums where you were uh, forcibly evicted, you have to find a way to survive the continuous eviction. Right, and invisibility and mobility is key, right? Now, wh what are the additional uh, um, understandings of, of 
reframing it from mere force addiction. One is that the process is, uh, and we already know this, it's incremental and the materials that are used depends on the available finance and the level of state surveillance, right? So the fastest and the cheapest possible material. Usually for non-mobile homes, it's old lumber, used plywood, tarpaulins that are tied together as walls and roofs. But people of, would also live in mobile homes, like tables. Um, I remember an old uh, grandmother who put uh, uh, wheels on her cart so that she can push her cart uh, when the demolition team comes. But she was so old, right? She has to rely on her neighbors to do the pushing, right? So, but uh, the, the shelter facilities, as we think of them as middle class, are broken up. You sleep in a different space, you cook in a different space, you eat in a different space, you bathe in a different space. So the, the notion of home as an integrated shelter facility is broken up. Uh, and then the home remaking is a community affair, right? So neighbors help, whether in terms of uh, providing areas uh, for bathing, for sleeping, materials, or for evading evictions, uh, or negotiating with, with government and so on. Right? And the other thing is uh, people break apart their families in order to remake their home. And they put the more vulnerable members of their families far away in order to survive and earn some income in the slum. Right? So for protection, they put them uh, with distant friends or families. But the earnings in the encroachment, if there's some left, is sent to the family members. So in a sense, encroachment back into the, into the slum or remaking back into the slum, home remaking back into the slum is a welfare improvement strategy among the poor, but it requires breaking up shelter as an integrated facility. It requires breaking up the family in order to do that. But it's, a, it's an economic improvement for the family in general. The other response is collective, it's uh, people's planning. Of course, this is a, uh, a bottom-up process. Uh, it's basically slum upgrading. It's a bottom-up process where people collectively plan and implement their uh, on-site or near-site upgrading. Often requires the help of uh, NGOs and what are called state champions, right? Uh, these are people who are sympathetic to urban poor advocacies, and they would often lend technical knowledge, networks, and state resources, find a way to access state resources. Uh, the picture on the side is an example of that. It's a, an example of the achievement of the people living in the waterway along the Posig River. It's able to accommodate 900 families within medium rice building facility, right? It's very near, right? But there, there's a constraint on the lack of availability of resources and land, which requires people to forsake, right? So, uh, so those with regular, and sufficient incomes are able to participate in this modality, right? But it's not able to accommodate all affected families, particularly the poorest of the poor, because you eventually have to pay for the housing, right? So advocates are calling for increased state subsidy, alternative ten tenural mechanisms, particularly that uh, which decrease the cost of land, like uh, 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 public rental systems or uh, uh, forgot the other term, uh, where the state remains the owner of the land. Um, and other people are, uh, Yusuf Ra, right? Uh, other people are advocating for the dislodging of uh, land for socialized housing away from the real estate market, right? Because uh, the poor are finding it really difficult to compete with the real estate in terms of housing price. So they find the land, but the landowner would rather sell to the real estate. Uh, rather than to the socialized housing sector. Okay. Um, okay, and the last one is a much more radical collective action. So um, barricades have been a technology of resistance among the urban poor, particularly those that are uh, affiliated with uh, more militant uh, organizations like the Kalipunan ng Damayang Mahirap or the National Alliance for Urban Poor. And in 2010, they actually, uh, uh, initiated a community barricade in a slum that they were protecting in Quezon City, right? So uh, it's important not just as a defense of slums, but it improves the technologies of resistance. I will go back to that a little later. And it also develops a sense of collective militancy among those who have participated. 
Right? So these are examples of the pictures of that slum in 2010. Uh, this is along the main highway in the Philippines. It created a traffic that basically stalled uh, city life in, in the Philippine capital, which forced the Philippine president, uh, President Aquino, during that time to suspend evictions and demolitions for three months. But eventually, the, the evictions continue up to the present time. Right? Now, uh, this is part of my ongoing work. Right? So uh, I'm trying to trace the evolution of uh, uh, resistances um, among the poor, particularly the militants. And uh, in 2017, the people who were participants in the barricades would organize and implement the um, occupation of empty housing uh, in off-city resettlement sites in, in the Philippine capital. And they were able to actually occupy some 5,200 empty homes, right? So, but this was not the first time that it was done. In 2016, there was a smaller, much unpublicized occupation where homeless farmers and, uh, and, uh, and renters, poor renters, also occupied abandoned uh, resettlement units that were flood prone, right? They were using basically the same technology, combining barricades with protest and collective militants. Right? So this was a shift from the defensive to offensive politics among the poor. So instead of just defending the line where habitation and the slum existed, you were now claiming uh, state resources and redistribu redistributing it in a way that the poor felt uh, was necessary. So it basically aimed for a while at least, to deteriorize capital and uh, elite state space. And they attempted to establish a crude version of a commune, collective planting, collective uh, uh, discipline, uh, collective uh, uh, defense systems, and so on. And they, of course, questioned property rights, and they defied state power, and they radically redistributed state resources because the units were supposedly uh, uh, allotted for a certain beneficiary. Right? By occupying them, and uh, they actually delayed the evictions of these uh, targeted beneficiaries. So overall, the occupation actually delayed some of the gentrification projects within larger Metro Manila. And a lot of the LGUs were complaining that there are no more resettlements because uh, Kadamai took over. Right? And it delayed some of the gentrification projects and the forced evictions of some of the slums in city in Metro Manila. Right? But now because of its militancy, it's now suffering and being subjected to diverse state containment, red tagging, uh, the criminalization of militancy. People are sur surveyed. Uh, they've been, I think there have been at least seven arrests of its leaders, right? So uh, the state now, which is turning to uh, uh, sort of a fascist government is actually targeting Kadamai primarily in, in the beginning because of the occupation. So um, actually, I, I end there. So let me summarize. Um, in this presentation, I, I looked at the political economy of socialized housing in the Philippines and how it has led to um, uh, unaffordability of socialized housing. And with the influx of capital into the socialized housing sector, both directly and indirectly, it has produced massive amounts of uh, off-city resettlement that the poor refuse to occupy. And the poor use uh, broad... Uh, resistance strategies from home remaking quietly, which uh, requires the breaking up of shelter as an integrated space and the breaking of families to collective grassroots planning for, for on-site or near-site resettlements to much more radical barricades and occupy movement. Right. So uh, these are some of the, the uh, references and uh, thank you for listening. Right. And I hope that you have uh, critical commentaries and questions. Okay. Thanks, uh, Chester, for that very insightful presentation. So, guys, we now open the virtual floor to questions and uh, feedback from you. Uh, Chester, if you could uh, unshare your screen so we can see everyone. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Just... Uh, so, guys, either you can type in your questions here at the chat box or raise your hand using the icon so I could call your name. Okay, maybe there's still uh oh yeah, Crystal. Uh, yes, please. Hi, Chester. Thanks. That was that was really terrific. Um, oh, what a great presentation. Um, 
one of the things that that came to mind when I was listening to your talk was the relationship between home remaking and and the way it was breaking up um, rather than the integrated sort of housing unit as we typically understand it and what the relationship is between that sort of fragmentation of home remaking and the collective action work um, that is being built in other spaces, whether or not the fragmentation and the kind of dispersal of home is also building other practices or, or linking to practices of solidarity formation in terms of widening and expanding the movement to uh, resist eviction. All right. Um so if I understood your question, you're basically asking what the relationship between the, the quiet home remaking with the collective, uh, uh, collective culture. Um, so first, the home remaking is basically not possible without the support of the peripheral neighborhood, right? So uh, one cannot basically go back to the slum because the state is still there, precisely because it wants it cleared, right? So uh, there's continued forced evictions in those spaces. So when you uh, encroach back into the slum, you basically need the, the support of uh, neighbors. That support can be uh, the provision simply of everyday needs or everyday spaces, right? So I've interviewed people who lived in their uh, pedicabs, right, uh, for three or four years. And they defecate in, in the toilets of other people, right, their friends, right, or they cook uh, and they, uh, people share their, their food and so on. So it can also be in terms of materials. People share whatever they have, uh, old lumber. It can also be the monitoring of forced evic evictions. If the state is coming in, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a method in the slum that they announce that the people are coming and you know, you know, get your, your home away if that's possible. So you roll your cart out, your bike out, uh, you hide everything right, in, in a space that's provided by your neighbors. So there's a collective culture that's a prerequisite to encroaching back into a threatened space, right? So that, of course, is not entirely positive. Sometimes there are people who want to claim the space as their own, and they view the, uh, and the people who encroach back into the slum as competition, right? So, uh, but there's a collective culture that's a prerequisite to, to homemaking. Plus, if you talk about the extended family, the ability of families to break up uh, so that they can encroach back relies on the support of extended families or friends outside of the slum, right? So uh, there are a couple of families I interviewed that they sent their children to distant family relatives, one in, in uh, as far as uh, Visayas, the other with uh, the, the, ho the home of the boyfriend and the home of friends and so on. One father was, a, uh, was forced to give up three of his children to a distant relative and just send money. And she, he was not able to recover back uh, and be reunited with the families. And he felt that they were in a better position, but that he was at least providing them economic support because of the income he was able to access by encroaching back into the slum. Right. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Crystal. We have uh, feedback from Erica. Erica, do you want to read out your feedback here? Um, hi, Ellen. Sorry, am I already unmuted? Okay, okay, I'll just read it out. Um, so thank you for um, breaking down um, what makes socialized housing a complex issue what, and what makes these inadequate for the urban poor. Um, particularly um, when you described um, how the NHA um, basically um, is a <laughs> glorified demolition crew, <laughs> uh, basically. So that 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 particular um, um, description was um, um, interesting and also explains a lot um, about their strategies towards the urban poor. It was also especially interesting to see the um, various strategies that the urban poor employs, um, and it helps shed light on a lot of um, misconceptions thrown around about movements like Kadamai. Um, I was actually supposed to. Um, um, ask a question about Kadamai, but um, you already included that in the um, in um, as part of the strategies that you explained. So it was great to um, it, it was great to see um, how um, how the urban poor um, organize in order to deal with 
um, it, in order to deal with um, these um, um, with these situations um, that the state basically uh, forces upon them. So it was really um, thank you that well that was really um, a lot of it was really enlightening. Yeah, well, thank you, Erica. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or feedback? Okay, uh, Helen, yes, please. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I thought it was really concise and precise and very eye-opening. Um, my question perhaps right, uh, relates to crystals in the sense that I wanted to ask about solidarity, but in the sense of a knowledge transfer, I was wondering whether any of these strategies that are being adopted by the activists are kind of drawing on similar experiences in other contexts, um, other countries, and also then whether these slum clearance techniques are also kind of mimicking or drawing on previous experiences either within the region um, or internationally. All right. Um the Philippine urban poor movement is very heterogeneous. Uh, people who are advo advocates of people's planning and policy reform on the one hand, and more militant uh, strategies and organizations like Kadamai, but all of them uh, engage in international relations, right? So they basically learn from the experiences of other countries, and they also share their experiences, whether as best practices or uh, stuff where other countries can learn from. But uh, within the country, uh, the technologies that are developed within particular spaces are often adopted depending on the assessment of communities on the possibilities of success or necessities, right? So but the barricade in 2010 implemented in, by Kadamai in situ San Roque would you know, spread in the entire country and, and many more communities who were facing evictions and demolitions would engage in barricade, right? So. Uh, and the other thing is that later on, the people who were uh, critical to uh, leadership in terms of barricade formations would uh, help organize the Occupy movement uh, of Kadamai. So they would emplace the strategies that were developed uh, in other places and put them in other places. And uh, it was a combination of uh, protest action, barricades, uh, uh, media and, and so on and so forth. But it was an advance because this time it was the urban poor who were dictating uh, the level of politics on the state. So the state was off, off guard. Uh, Kadamai would try to at least, uh, Kadamai and other groups that were uh, linked to its militancy would try to occupy other spaces, but the state would uh, put in military after the, the Occupy movement, it would militarize the socialized housings that were empty later on. So the other attempts uh, would not succeed, but uh, it has inspired thinking about can the poor become a primary political mover in terms of occupying not just empty socialized housing, but also let's say empty uh, lands within the city and claim it for their own and build their own homes within the empty lands in, in the in Philippine cities, right? So it has inspired thinking uh, at that level. Okay, so we have a, uh question in the chat box from Eric. So we'll get to that first and then I'll call Kim. So Eric, if you want to raise your question now. Uh, thank you, Regan. Thank you, Chester. The presentation was amazing. Um, I am doing my PhD thesis on Indonesia and communities living in flood prone areas. I'm also from Brazil and I've seen this in Brazil as well. So my, my thought here is that hazards such as landslides and floods are very often used to justify moving people away from their houses. I wonder if you have any thoughts on this and in Philippines, if that's the case, do you see another alternative of how to keep people in places while still managing those risks? Right, um, a friend of mine, uh, Tin Alvarez has written something on revenge's urbanism and how um, the clearing of the waterways as a way to mitigate flooding and protect the poor, right, against flooding was actually used as a, a, a veil to actually evict the poor from these spaces, right, and put them in a actually much riskier space because the resettlements are very far from livelihood. And some of these resettlements, because of their low value, precisely of their low value, are actually flood blown areas, right, and actually are areas where. Uh, um, fault lines exist, right? So 
uh, by looking at uh, the risk, the level of risk, whether you talk about flooding or earthquakes, um, and uh, tracing the families in city, in the waterways or their spaces of eviction, uh, it's revealed that the entire hazard is, is used as a veil to actually evict the poor from the city. And it's supported by a lot of the middle class. I remember uh, when I was trying to help uh, one of the groups uh, protect their community, we asked help from the church to say mass in the community. And the priest said, I can't do that because I'm saying mass in the same mall uh, whose owner is trying to evict the, the community, right? So even the church and the very religious in the Philippines are supporting the forced evictions as a way of uh, cleaning the city and making it much more productive. So a lot of the advocates are saying that there must be, uh, uh, the state must be open to technical, technological innovations. It means that, is it possible to use technology to mitigate the risk in terms of flooding? And the second is that uh, in the Philippines, at least, there is no proof that it's the, the slums along the waterways that are causing the flooding. Rather, uh, there's very little stud evidence of that. And there's a lot of assertion that it's actually the expansion of the real estate that's in uh, uh, claiming, and the middle class is claiming the waterways that's causing the flooding, right? So, uh, so I think in short, uh, we need to explore at least the availability of technology to resolve the, the hazard question before entertaining evictions because we put people at more risk if, if we do that. Okay, so we'll now have uh, Kim and then David. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks Chester uh, for another great presentation and great to uh, see you again. Uh, look, it, it strikes me, that I'm not sure if there's a question here or a comment, but that, that the various uh, kind of activities that uh, communities are engaged in and that really all of us are engaged in, uh, we need um, a higher level of debate about which of these tactics work best under what circumstances and so on. Then it struck me both when I was in Manila and, um, and people were telling me, oh, Kadame, you can't work with Kadame because they were involved in an occupation. And, uh, and this is a typical kind of a, a red tagging in a sense. But it also strikes me listening to you that occupation is probably not a good tactic because you, you've already shown us, I think, that the, that the empty houses are empty because they're in the wrong location. But this is a, like it's a, it's a fundamentally a faulty kind of system and that the, the emptiness of the houses, if, the, if only the empty houses are, are being occupied, then they're occupying housing in a difficult location. Um, I, I'm wondering what you think about other, I mean, I, I think you've, you've explored other tactics like the kind of quiet resistance, but also a more organised um, people's planning. And I think those are all um, pretty important. Um, what's the role of the media in, in, in your mind? I mean, I was struck in Manila that um, we, we pointed out in a, a fairly public forum that, that there's an 18-hole golf course uh, in the middle of Quezon City that is ripe for redevelopment right across the road from uh, San Roque. And the, the answer we got back from high-level academics and professionals was, it, it, it wasn't that we've, we've thought about that and, and made a different plan. It was, um, it's not a golf course. That's what they said. It's an 18 hole golf course. And what they said, no, it's a hospital. <laughs> um, so isn't, isn't there something about the way in which discourse, uh, public discourse constructs a narrative about what's going on that is at the moment really quite compelling to the people in power and yet it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, strange kind of narrative where you can't redevelop a golf course because it's not a golf course, it's a, it's a hospital. Uh, right, uh, great question, Kim. Right, so, uh, and uh, there are several layers to the question. Let me try to unpack, right? So uh, the urban poor movement in the Philippines is very heterogeneous, right? So if you link that to the larger uh, left movement in the Philippines in 1992, the general left would break up into two major strands, right? And the more militant is associated to one of the strands and the people who began exploring spaces to work with government, uh, remain within the legal bounds, uh, are associated with the other strand. So their relationship is both productive and complex and sometimes unproductive, right? Um, now, and then on the one end, uh, some of these groups would uh, red tag one another, right? Uh, but on the other hand, they would also use the threat of radicality 
as a way to uh, increase democratic space. So I've seen letters that of organizations that belong to the less militant group of the urban poor, but militant nonetheless, right? But they're saying that if you don't do this, we'll, uh, we'll take Kadamai as a model and do what they did and just occupy the units, right? So you better talk to us. You better talk to us in a way that matters, right? So these technologies are, are, are very, uh, they're very porous and that different groups use them at different points in time, depending on their pragmatic analysis of the feasibility of the struggle. Right. So people uh, who are less organized would, of course, engage in quiet uh, home remaking, but the more organized would often uh, use people's planning, but they would also protest. They would also engage in street protests. They would uh, uh, employ the threat of barricades or even barricade or they may begin with a barricade and then later on talk to government about people's planning. Right. So these are very porous and they, they're not very exclusive to each other. Um, now, uh, for media, the general media is basically anti-poor, right? So uh, it basically looks at the poor as uh, unproductive, highly dependent on government, and they should be, you know, they're wanting free, free housing when the middle class themselves have to work for the housing and pay for the housing. The middle class themselves have to commute long, uh, long commutes, suffer long commutes in order to access their own homes. And the poor are, are wanting a central space in the city and wanting it free, right? So Yet there's some progressive media that's being developed. I, I remember uh, some time ago, we tried talking to the general media and trying to explain, but uh, it did not fare out very well. Now, you're talking about a particular golf, golf course across San Roque, and actually I was pushing that. Let's think about the golf course and actually demanding from government to develop it because technically it's idle land and within the purview of the law, idle land can be explored as sites for socialized housing, right? And you're correct that discourses, the way discourses have been uh, framed, and I'm going to go back to my initial answer, is actually influenced by which organization actually penetrates and tries to help a community resist, right? So these organizations carry with them uh, primary strategies that they rely upon, but they would, of course, explore other available strategies depending on the need. But... Uh, they basically define what's doable at one point in time at a, a certain extent, right? So um, I share your uh, opinion that uh, if the land in San Roque cannot be, uh, whether politically extra legal or legal, cannot be explored for on-site housing, uh, at least uh, the golf course across the public hospital should be explored as a site for public housing because that's very big and it's just across the street, right? But uh, uh, I'm not sure whether the community has, uh, has talked about that. I certainly suggested that uh, early on. So I hope I answered your question, Kim. Okay, so it's already three o'clock guys, but we still have, I think, two questions. So I'm going to entertain them. I'll probably call David first and then ask uh, Stephanie as well to read out her feedback before I call in Chester to respond. Yeah? Then after that, we will close. David, yes. Thanks, Redden. And thank you, Chester, for your paper. Um, one thing that struck me most was the, the uh, data you showed, which really that all of the increase in GDP uh, had been... Um, basically appropriated by people that, other than the ones that, let's just say the people that aren't people that earn money by drawing a wage. And I think that that's, might very well include, you know, I mean, in our country, most of the middle class are wage earners as well. Um, and I'm just pulled up some kind of stats to understand. And it says here that this is Singaporean source. It says that 58% of Filipinos are low income and about 40% middle income and then the rest. So it's one thing for people to try and save their houses, you know, but as an economist once said to me, are, do people have no houses? Oh, are people poor because they have no houses or do they have no houses because they're poor? So it seems like the big game is what the hell is going on with the overall governance structure of the Philippines? You know, we can f fight the fight at the front lines, but beyond the front lines, somebody's expropriating all the wealth. Is, is anything afoot at this higher level to actually change that? 
Right, that's a great question, uh, David, and it's a really requires a really long answer. We have to trace the history of colonialism in my country <laughs> and concentration of land upon which surplus that flowed into manufacture, basically reassembly of imported products would actually flow. And then it will flow later into the monopolization of the banking system. So basically to sum it up, there's a huge monopolies in agricultural land, um, real estate, uh, banking, and, uh, and the economy is actually, the agricultural economy is going down for the last 30 or 40 years. And then the industry has also been going down, so it's unable to generate uh, employment, right? And the, the part of the economy that's uh, rising is services, right? Mainly propelled by real estate, uh, malls, and uh, a high-end uh, consumption, right? So a lot of that is labor-intensive, but also doesn't provide very secure employment. Right, so uh, you're correct. The struggle, therefore, at the front lines seems to be a struggle for homes, but these are homes of the informals in general, in the sense that these are also sites of livelihood because they've been very creative in crafting uh, surplus flows within the spaces of the city. So they intrude public spaces uh, or uh, create their homes where, where capital is flowing, right? And they get part of that. So these are spaces of livelihood too. So even though these are spaces of shelter, these are also spaces of livelihood. So uh, maybe going back to David Harvey's uh, observation that we need to continue organizing workers, but we also need to open up ourselves to organizing communities because this is where uh, cities, uh, this is the front line of the struggle for many workers and many urban poor communities. So, uh, sorry, Thank David, you, it's a, it requires a really long answer. Uh, you've made me very interested in those Philippines all of a sudden, though. So that's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Stephanie had to run to another activity, so probably just read out her feedback. Just a comment, but linked with uh, Eric's reflection. This notion of the state violently producing housing demand is really provocative. It reminds me of other contexts in which state produces risk, as Eric outlines, or produces scarcity through inadequate infra infrastructural provision. It would be interesting to trace how these processes are happening in very contextualized but overlapping ways. Chester, do you want to briefly respond to this? And yeah. then, yeah. Just say, I agree. That would be really interesting to unpack institutional practices and how they, they merge with the larger uh, uh, distribution of wealth and the flows of capital and how these actually produce on the one end uh, more vulnerabilities and more disposabilities. And, but on the other, it also allows the private sector to actually control the production of infrastructure for a lot of the marginalized. So. Okay, so that's all the time we have, guys. But again, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chester Ar Arcilla for another very insightful presentation. It, your insights have really strengthened our resolve to study the nexus between informal trading, transport, and uh, settlement in many urban global south cities. So we'll probably, of course, keep in touch with you on how we're going to proceed with that uh, research engagement. Okay, so participants, again, thank you for your participation and uh, your questions. Just one announcement before we close. Our next webinar will be held on May 26, uh, 2 p.m. again, Melbourne time. And we will have uh, Dr. Helen Geiger speaking about improvised cities, architecture, urbanization, and innovation in Peru. So another Global South context. We're hoping to see you again next month. And again, thank you, Chester. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you.